This is Middlesex Moments. I'm Jonathan Dowby, Interim President of Middlesex Community College, and my guest today is Rich Lenosi, a very senior professor at Middlesex Community College. How many, how many years have you been he- here well, at the it's, college? Well, it's interesting. This is my 18th year uh, here, that at makes the, you senior. here at the college, but I had taught one course back in 1993 when I graduated from college and was in uh, graduate school. So that actually makes me, I think, the, the fourth longest employee on campus because I, I taught that one course and then took a break for uh, 10 years and came back oh, full so, time. Oh, all right. But, but you've been here since the early 90s. Yes, since bas- 93. Basically. Yeah. How has the college changed in, in, those, in that time? Wow, how has it changed? Well, back then, um, things were very rigid and process-oriented, and it took a long time to get changes made and things to go through and to buy a pencil or, uh, in my case, uh, video equipment. It could sometimes take years. We were a bureaucratic <laughs> state agency. <laughs> we were. We were, we were much more bureaucratic then. And now um, a variety of systems have been put in place in about the last 10 years that I think have, have opened the college up, uh, both in terms of accessibility to students as well as our accessibility to be able to move forward with program changes and being able to get the things that we need and being able to get things done much more smoothly. So I didn't even say what you were professor of. What, no, do, you you profe- what do you profess? <laughs> I profess that I am, the, I am uh, not only a professor, but I am the program coordinator of the Broadcast Cinema Program here at Middlesex. So tell us about the Broadcast Cinema Program. Well, we are an occupational program, um, and that means... That means you lead to jobs. Lead directly to jobs, yes. Okay. Some of our students transfer, but the the goal of the program is for students to complete the program and go immediately to work. Uh, And uh, that is really in uh, the broad area of communications, but more specifically uh, television broadcasting. Uh, behind the camera uh, type work, as well as uh, cinema film production, which Connecticut uh, has a growing industry. And since right we're now. on radio right now, radio also? Radio also. Um, not so much because we don't have a radio station here on campus, which makes it difficult uh, for us to uh, train students uh, in on air production. But behind the scenes, uh, as far as audio editing and radio production, yes. And for everyone who's in front of the scene, so to speak, there are thousands behind the scenes, aren't there? Yes, there are many more. Yeah, this is Middlesex Moments. I'm Jonathan Dowby, and we'll be back momentarily. This is Middlesex Moments. I'm Jonathan Dowby, Interim President of Middlesex Community College, and my guest today is Rich Lenosi, and he heads up a program at Middlesex Community College that leads directly to jobs, and it's in the area of communications. And we were just beginning to talk about broadcast and film. Tell us a bit about what you te- what do you teach people. If I come into your program, what am I going to learn? Well, the, it it really takes. Uh, uh, we break it down into four components. The first the first semester, you come in and you learn about the careers. Uh, people who come in want to know the types of jobs that are out there, um, mm-hmm. as well as how the industry functions. And then for um, uh, the rest of your education, you'll be trained on uh, the equipment and uh, techniques used in uh, the broadcast and uh, film industries uh, so that when you graduate, you can uh, go directly into a job at a television station, uh, broadcast network, on a film set uh, for a film that says coming to Connecticut and shooting or for a small production company that does say corporate videos. And are there still jobs out there? Surprisingly, it's a growing field. Connecticut is attracting films here to the state. About five years ago, uh, tax credits were initiated in the state to uh, essentially give a a tax credit money back on taxes to the Mm -hmm. uh, film companies that come to Connecticut, usually from Hollywood or New York, to do their filming here. That's been quite successful, and they've been uh, actually demanding that Connecticut provide uh, a workforce so they don't have to bring them all the way from California, that they're actually, they can actually hire people here do, on do site. Do you have a sense of what a beginning salary might be for someone who goes through your program? Yeah, well, beginning salaries are, are interesting because I present them to students and they sound rather low, but people move up the ladders fairly high. At a, um, an ESPN, for instance, it's about $15 an hour. 
Um, but there's mm-hmm. mandatory overtime that they're required to put in, et cetera. So, and then within a year or two, their salaries increase quite quickly. To, to what? So within, say, five years, what could a person oh, reasonably I'm, expect? Forty to fifty-five thousand dollars for a young person in their mid twenties, which many of our graduates are. I think that's wow. a good salary. Yes. And to get into your program in the first place, what kind of credentials or qualifications would a person need? Well, the only thing that really matters, you know, we have a lot of people who come in and they've, you know, taken video production in high school or whatever. That, that's not really a requirement. The important thing is English, is writing. Because in, in our business, it's all about telling stories. So they have to be able to write stories and think up stories and mm-hmm. be able to organize mm-hmm. their ideas and then communicate those ideas to the rest of the people on their crew. So writing is extremely important. So uh, to get into the program, they have to place into English 101 college composition. And that's, that's really it. And uh, many students who come out of high school do that. So, uh, and if they don't, we offer uh, remedial courses to bring them up to speed. So what I'm hearing is what I'm hearing about a lot of programs. If someone's out there listening and they don't quite know what, what they might want to do when they grow up, mm. quote unquote, however old they might be, or they're unemployed or underemployed, if they're motivated, mm. big if, if they're motivated and they really want to do the work, and if they're interested in writing, mm-hmm. they don't even have to be that good at it, but if they're interested in learning how to be good right. at it, uh, your program might be might be right for them. Right, and then and then once they come in, we teach them how to operate the cameras, how to do the video editing, and all the different processes that go along with that: the lighting, the sound. You you so. said that the first thing you teach them about though is what kinds of jobs are out there. Yes. Tell me a bit about that. Well, we have to look at the job market here in. In Connecticut, we are right. not Hollywood, California. Uh, we're not even New York City. Uh, we have a different market, and we support um, industries that have very specific jobs in them. So, if you wanted to be a country music uh, audio engineer, it's probably not the place for you. Uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Tennessee I would, would say, be a little I would better. recommend go yes. there. But if you wish to work work in uh, journalism. Uh, Connecticut, most of the jobs in broadcasting are in journalism, uh, Channel 3, Channel 8. You know, we look at these large broadcast stations here. They have, uh, you know, 100, 150 people who are working behind the scenes in news on uh, each one of them, as well as you look at ESPN. Which I didn't realize thousands. it was that many. Yes. Yeah, yeah. There's probably 150 people working at the television stations, you know, supporting uh, what we see on the air every night. Uh, and you look at ESPN, you're, you're, it's thousands. Of people, and they're right here in Bristol. You know, they're 20 minutes from our campus. Yeah, I'm trying That's to think exciting. that through. That <laughs> means there are a lot of jobs every single year, mm-hmm. I would think. Yeah, they've been hiring ESPN. They're in a little lull now because of the economy, like everybody. But on average, they were they were hiring about 100 to 150 people a year uh, with job openings yeah. on the bottom level. Now, now, do your students have internship? Capabilities. Yes, that is uh, the fourth phase of their their education after they've learned all the components, uh, you know, running the camera, editing, the electronic equipment, the writing, the telling the stories, actually producing things. Their final semester um, is the most important. They have to produce a thesis project, usually a short film, uh, something along those lines, or a, uh, a broadcast uh, that they have to put together themselves and manage. And then while they're doing that, they're also applying for internships. Uh, at the various television stations um, and with film companies. Is an internship usually paid or unpaid? They're usually unpaid. There are some that are paid. ESPNs are paid. If you can get in the door there, they'll pay, they pay the internship. Uh, but most of them are unpaid. But they're a foot in the, more than a foot in the door. It's a foot in the door. The whole body's in the door. <laughs> the whole body's <laughs> in the door. In uh, broadcasting, uh, since it develops from the old uh, printing apprenticeship uh, form of education, uh, an internship is required to get a job. You won't get hired unless you have an internship. You have to go through that process. And usually the people you meet at the internship, uh, if the internship itself doesn't hire you, if they don't have an opening, there's usually someone in the department who knows someone who's hired. Now, Now, do you find that your graduates have to be willing to move 
say, to New York or wherever, or other jobs in Connecticut? If they're gearing themselves for the types of jobs in Connecticut, they usually can stay here. Uh, we have had students who pack their bags the day of graduation because they want to go to Hollywood and they want to make it big in film. And, and surprisingly, there are several who've done that. Uh, so they, they uh, uh, pack their car and drive off and start knocking well, on doors. Tell us about some of the, the graduates you've had over the years. Oh, we've, had, we've had some great ones. Um, uh, I'm thinking of when I mentioned California, we had a student several years ago from East Haddam, uh, Mark Servilio was his name. And he, on that day of graduation, he wanted to be a, a, a video editor on a television program or a film and got in the car, went out to California and for three months knocked on every editing house in Hollywood until he got a job as assistant editor on a network television show called Veronica Mars. And he was 20 years old. <laughs> you know, it's, Is he still out there? He's still yeah. out there and he's still working in the business. Uh, we just had a, uh, a student, um, Megan Brophy, who uh, informed me last week that she was just hired by uh, ESPN, and I don't think Megan's 21 yet. And, you know, she's working for a major network and a very good job. Uh, on people who've been around for a while, I, I hear from people, uh, the uh, assistant news director at Channel 3, uh, Patience Hetrick, uh, she lives in Portland. Uh, she uh, is a graduate of our program, and uh, we have about five people, I think, at Channel 3, uh, who are involved in the nightly news who are fairly high up in the ranks uh, who work there and are Middlesex grads. So if you get into the news, it'll play, it'll play well, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> it will. Perhaps. It will. Uh, what, about, what about students who go on to bachelor's degrees? Do you have some of those as well? Definitely. Those tend to be the students who want to um, do the... Uh, I don't want to say more sophisticated jobs, but the ones that require a bachelor's degree. A journalist would be an example, someone in front of the camera who's researching stories. Um, and, you know, they have to understand political science, how the Constitution works, how the criminal system works. Yeah. And uh, you really can't fit that in in two years. They have to go for four years, as well as the people who want to be uh, motion picture directors, et cetera, who need to go to film school. How, how many people do you tend to have in your program at any one time? Well, at, at any one time, we have about 60 majors. Um, 45 of them are, are what we call active majors. They're actively taking courses on a part-time basis uh, to get a degree. And then there's usually about 20 students who are here full-time all the time and uh, are really involved in, in the program in the department. So anyone who's listening who's really intrigued could call you up directly, presumably, and talk with you and Please. get a feel. <laughs> Let's give them a number. 860-343-5796. Oh, uh, uh, okay, 343-5796. Yes. And it helps if they have a GED or a high school diploma, but I yes. assume you'll talk to a anyone who, maybe somebody who still needs to get Yes. If they're, if they're enthusiastic, if they have the, the motivation, if they know how to show up on time. Uh, that, that, that is that the most thing. important thing in the business. <laughs> show I, up guess, on time. I guess so. I guess so. This is Middlesex Moments. I'm Jonathan Dowby, and we'll be back momentarily. This is Middlesex Moments. I'm Jonathan Dowby, Interim President of Middlesex Community College. And my guest today is Richard Lenosi, who's a senior professor at the college and program coordinator for the Broadcast Cinema Program. And we're talking about the kinds of jobs that that program leads to immediately and in Connecticut, and that they can pay, well, Fifteen dollars an hour, maybe some of your graduates well, get little. to start, and then it Just, moves up. Then, it, really then it moves up. Well, I was really listening when you said, for many of your students, it can move up to as much as forty to fifty thousand a year. Mm -hmm. uh, sounds pretty good to me. In a short period of time. In a short <laughs> period of time, and anyone who's seriously interested can call Rich at eight six zero three four three five seven nine six. Now, I'm kind of intrigued what brought you to being a faculty member here. Well, tell us, you know, you, I assume you went to college at mm -hmm. some point. Yes. I haven't checked, but I assume you did. And then what? Well, it's an interesting story. I uh, got out of college and um, had trouble finding my 
first full-time job and uh, got into a master's program and then uh, at the same time was freelancing. And uh, that, that's working day, day to day. I, I did some work with CBS and NBC when they would come to the state. I'd run a camera or help out in the truck and things like that. And at the same time... This was time, in Connecticut. This was in Connecticut, yeah. yeah. And uh, at the same time, I uh, took on an uh, adjunct faculty position here and really liked the college. I was very impressed with the students. And a- after I completed that one semester in 1983, I was hired across town here at Aetna Life and Casualty, where I uh, was a video engineer. I designed video systems there. They had a broadcast facility right in this beautiful big building, which they're in the process now of tearing down. Uh, But they were building it, and it was one of the most sophisticated broadcast centers in the country uh, that Aetna had, and I was in charge of it. And I was there for 10 years. Why did you ever leave? Um, Maybe well they, you knew they were going to tear it down. <laughs> well, they, they left me. Their uh, business changed to be um, more healthcare focused. Okay. Uh, yeah. And uh, they did a lot of layoffs and a lot of what they call outsourcing, where they only hired the video people when they needed them. And I, actually, I yeah. did that for a, a period after, after I left. Uh, but while I was there for those 10 years, I uh, would always have a Middlesex intern uh, working for me. And then eventually I'd end up hiring that person. And I was really impressed with the faculty here who I'd met, uh, Professor John Schaefer, who's still here, mm-hmm. uh, is, is just tops. And his students uh, were superb. They understood the business. They understood timeliness. Uh, they understood uh, professionalism. They understood workflow, how to, how to do things in a professional way to get the jobs done, and was very impressed with that. And then I was contacted just about the time that the layoff notices were going out at Aetna uh, in the communications area. They laid everyone off. And uh, I was offered a job here. Uh, I was asked to apply. and was welcome to apply. I applied a couple of years before for a position, and they were impressed with me and wanted to call me back. So Is there did. a difference between teaching in this area and doing, if you will, or are you really still doing while you're teaching? Talk a bit about that, well, what I, it's like to be a teacher. I, I think Middlesex is an interesting place, and I think if you went to every occupational program, you'd see this, is that at, at a university, I think a professor considers themselves a, a professor first. And I think, though I consider myself a professor first, I'm also always involved in, in projects. Uh, here two years ago, we uh, uh, did the state film industry training program training, where I was involved working with uh, Hollywood professionals that we had here on campus to uh, teach uh, students in the non-credit area how to work on a film set. And that was very exciting. Uh, you know, occasionally we get phone calls here on campus where a specific company needs, needs work done or needs a project that we can involve students with in an educational way and then mm-hmm. put my professional hat back on and uh, walk out the door and I'm a producer again. Uh, uh, several years ago uh, we received a grant to produce a network television pilot and we involved students so suddenly I wasn't the professor anymore I was the executive producer. So I can I can actually I love the job because I can wear both hats I can be involved in the job I love with which is making cre- and creating media, as well as the other job I love, which is teaching. Now, we keep reading about, uh, you know, students not having literacy skills that they ought to have and so on. Is there some truth to that, or do they write pretty well? What's your, what's your experience? I have some students who are exceptional. They come in with stories to tell, and they want to tell them, and they just need a format to do it. Uh, and we provide mm-hmm. them with that, with the script writing classes and then the production classes so they can tell their stories. And on the other hand, I have students who are very interested. They want to work in the business but, and, and want to succeed, uh, and they need some help. You know, they, they, their writing skills are not up to par and wouldn't be accepted at a television station. Everybody writes in, in the business. So you run a camera, you edit, you're writing reports, and you're doing things that uh, involve writing. So, so do you send them over to the English department? Or? We work very closely with the English department and uh, uh, work with 
those students to get those skills up to a point where they can work it they can take courses in television production and script writing and be able to write the script and communicate their thoughts and ideas now I, I, a personal question I think yeah. I write fairly well what would I learn if I went into your script writing course what could you teach me well Many people, if, if you have the ideas for stories coming into the script writing course, what we do is we teach you the various formats that... Uh, like? Well, the, there's different formats so, such as uh, news copy, uh, what we call news copy. That would be a news story, and it's written a certain way with a certain number of words in each sentence and uh, is written at a certain in level. In each sentence? In each sentence, because you can't have long sentences on the air. They pe people who are uh, news anchors, et cetera, will get tangled up in words. So you have to write in a very structured way for them. Uh, okay. I never th realized that they have a limited number of words they can have in sentences. <laughs> is, that, is that really the case? It is really the case, because if, uh, if you're writing a, uh, a book, for instance, you can have all kinds of colons and semicolons, and your sentences can be structured uh, and be very quite lengthy. But in television news, it has to be very short, it has to be uh, very precise, because most of these news stories are only 10 seconds, 15 seconds, 30 seconds long. And so you have to tell a lot of, put a lot of information into uh, very few words. So I have to learn how to be crisp, precise, and you grade against that? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, clarity is very important. And also uh, using words that are easy for news anchors to pronounce. <laughs> because it can be, uh, you know, you don't, you don't want to play uh, uh, stump the news anchor while the teleprompter is running. And that, that's an entry-level position at a, at a television station is writing news stories and preparing them for the teleprompter, for the talent. Now, when I'm watching the, the 11 o'clock news at night, any station, mm -hmm. do I assume that the, the news person there has a teleprompter in front of him? They almost always do. Yes. They're not just speaking off the cuff no, from in, notes. Unless there is um, a breaking story and they can't get it up on the prompter quick enough, uh, then they will hand it to the news anchor during a break. Uh, but for the most part, it's teleprompter. Wow. This is fascinating. So anyone who, who is listening to us who's kind of interested in broadcast media hmm? uh, and thinks they might have a future in that, if they're motivated, they should give you a call. Give me a call. And uh, tell me briefly, uh, and I should give you the number, give them the number, 860-343-5796. Just tell me briefly, how is your program going to change, do you think, in the next five years? Well, digital technology is changing everything. In the way, I don't think television is going to look the way it looks now. I think uh, television will be more an on-demand uh, medium uh, than it currently is. And I think what do you mean by on demand? Well, right now, if you want to watch a television program, you go home and it's at a certain time, or you want to watch the news, it's at a certain time. I, I don't think that's going to be the case in five years. I think we're moving to a more uh, video on demand structure. You want to watch the news, you will go home, flip on the TV set, you'll hit a button that says news, and you will get the latest news that way. Wow. And that presumably means more people working for the, for whom? For the news station, for, for the, the channel? For, for the news stations, the channels, the television <coughs> stations. So understanding digital media and how it works, that uh, because, for example, uh, 15 years ago, our students used to do their television productions, their short films, and they used to put them on tape. Well, nobody puts them on tape anymore. Then we had them put them on DVD. And now nobody puts their productions on DVD anymore. So we what do they do now? Send them right up to online. And in five, within five years, that'll, that'll be different, too. And within five years, that'll be different, too. It's fascinating. It is. It's a, it's a world that I, I'm still having difficulty getting used to. This has been Middlesex Moments. My guest has been Rich Lenosi. If you're interested in his, his program, his broadcast cinema program, call him at 860-343-5796. Take a look at our website, mxcc.comnet, with two m's, comnet.edu. 
I'm Jonathan Dowby, Interim President of Middlesex Community College. Have a good day.